fracking. I introduced the legislation to ban hydrofracking in New York State. I personally do not think that there are any strong regulations that we could possibly implement to protect the water supply and the environment. This hearing, this forum today, is to elicit testimony from everybody. Because of the fact, we seem to have some indication that the governor and the Department of Environmental Conservation are moving ahead all of a sudden rather quickly, and the possibility of permits being issued um, could come rather quickly. The governor said early on that he would uh, make his decision on whether or not to do hydrofracking based upon the science. And we have a number of people here that will testify to the fact that we haven't heard from the science. And if anything, the scientific expertise and testimony that has been out in the public forum indicates that hydrofracking is not a safe practice to allow in New York State. So I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you. There are uh, obviously other aspects to the testimony today, including the fact that apparently State DEC um, released some of the proposed regulations to the oil and natural gas industry prior to releasing to the public, which a number of us feel is highly unethical. We also found out last week that Nationwide Insurance Company considers hydrofracking too much of a risk to underwrite. So there are a lot of things that are now coming together that we need to talk about here today um, and hopefully convince the governor and the Republican-controlled state senate that hydrofracking is not a good thing for New York State, that we must protect New Yorkers from this very dangerous environmental issue. Um, I've said publicly, and I'll end with this comment, that hydrofracking is the most serious environmental issue that this state has faced in 100 years, and the ramifications, if we allow it, could be with us for a 1,000 years. Um, why don't I start on my left, uh, Senator Adabo, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, thank you, Senator Avella, and I want to thank you and your staff for uh, doing this forum, and I want to thank all those who are here with us today. Uh, thank you for your time and for your input on what is, in my belief, the single most current environmental issue this state is facing and possibly and most likely in its future history for this state as the most important environmental issue that we will be dealing with. The negative aspects of uh, fracking are reversible, irreversible. And so for our people, for our businesses throughout this state, uh, these ramifications, we, they will live with forever. So it's important that we deal with these issues as we go forward in a very cautious manner. As our Senator Vela has mentioned, the governor looking forward to possibly issue permits. We need to be very careful as we go forward. And certainly, it cannot be done without input from our people. So again, I appreciate your time and your input and your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Perkins. Thank you very much. I want to first thank you very much for uh, convening this uh, forum, this opportunity for us to uh, share with the public our concerns and uh, to also let it be clear to Governor Cuomo to stop fracking around with our help. <laughs> I'm New York State Senator Bill Perkins and I'm opposed to hydrofracking because it puts our children's future at risk. New York City residents have a tremendous stake in whether Governor Cuomo allows hydrofracking in New York. This dangerous method of natural gas drilling threatens our water, air, food, and health. Along with a growing number of elected officials, local leaders, and community organizations have come to the conclusion that fracking is not safe and should be banned statewide. Fracking involves injecting millions of gallons of water mixed with toxic chemicals and sand underground to release gas that is trapped inside shale rock. While this drilling would occur many miles from the five boroughs, the health of our city's eight million residents would be threatened by the pollution, toxins, and dangerous waste produced by fracking. In New York City, we enjoy some of the greatest tap water in the world and it's something that we are proud of as New Yorkers. Our water comes from watersheds upstate that are so pure and well protected that it does not have to be filtered. In addition to jeopardizing the health of New York City residents, contamination of these watersheds from fracking could require the construction of an estimated $10 billion filtration plant. 
The fluid used in the fracking process contains six, around 600 chemicals, many linked to cancer and other health problems. Up to 80% of this toxic fluid stays underground where it could eventually flow into our sources of water. Moreover, there is no safe way to treat the toxic wastewater that is brought back to the surface. The bottom line is this. The Cuomo administration's proposal to protect New York City's watersheds is inadequate to ensure the safety of our water. And from an environmental justice point of view, fracking also threatens New York City's air quality. In the 30th senatorial district, which I represent, we have some of the highest incidences of respiratory disease and asthma rates that are already tragically high. Fracking requires thousands of heavy duty truck trips to bring water, equipment, and chemicals to drilling sites. And the fracking process itself can release particulates and other pollution that form smog, which has been linked to asthma, heart disease, and other health problems. A largely populated county in Wyoming, overrun by fracking, now has the worse air quality than even in Los Angeles. Another way New Yorkers' health is threatened by fracking is by radon, an odorless and invisible killer. The shale formations in New York contain high levels of radioactive gas. The DEC tests have found thousands of times the maximum level of radiation and wastewater produced from shale wells in New York. The high levels of radon present in New York shale gas, present in New York shale gas deposits which travel with the extracted natural gas and pipelines to our homes in New York City. If you use a gas stove or heat with natural gas, terrifying amounts of radon could silently and invisibly spew out of your burners and end up in your lungs. If all this isn't enough, fracking also endangers the safety of our food. Upstate New York, where the fracking would occur, is a major source of apples, dairy, vegetables, and a vast range of other agricultural products that we eat. The water and air pollution from fracking threatens the health of our land and food, a reason why a growing number of chefs, farmers, and other food producers have joined the fight against this dangerous practice. Furthermore, in the states of Ohio and Pennsylvania, where hydrofracking has been permitted, a rising incidences of earthquakes and other unusual seismic activity in points to yet another potential danger of this controversial mining process. There is evidence linking fracking to earthquakes, and the methane leaked by fracking is a major contributor to climate change. On top of that, the industry's job creation claims are wildly overblown. Any jobs created by hydrofracking would only be temporary and not worth the long-term implications of contaminating our air, water, and food. The evidence is in, and the science is clear. Fracking is inherently dangerous, cannot be done safely, and is beyond our ability to regulate. I am proud to stand with my Senate colleagues and a growing movement of New Yorkers who are calling for a ban on fracking in New York. We urge Governor Cuomo to join us in standing up to oil and gas industry and ban fracking in New York. Stop fracking around without help. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> I, stole it, I stole it from you. <laughs> Senator Kruger. Thank you, everyone. Well, I'm very proud to be here with my colleagues, particularly Tony Avella, who's been an incredible leader in the fight to educate the legislature and the public to the dangers of fracking. And I think my colleague Bill Perkins pretty much just went down the laundry list of why it is clear to me and has been that the science and the evidence are quite clear that this cannot be done safely anywhere in the state of New York. Perhaps someday the industries will figure out a way to remove gas from below the Marcellus Shale without putting our environment at risk, but clearly that is not the reality today. Now the good news is we don't actually need that gas today. And it will stay there underground. And when someday somebody comes up with a mechanism by which to withdraw natural gas, and if we need it, can be done safely, then it will be still there waiting for us. But at this point in time, there is no justification to put our environment and our people at risk from uh, signing off on permits in any of the counties of New York State to drill. And 
and I actually think this is a great example of does it matter who runs your government. I'm very confident that if my Democratic colleagues were the majority in the Senate and Tony Avella was the chair of the Environmental Committee, both houses would have passed legislation in the last section that made sure that none of us, none of us had to be worried about permitting going forward. Unfortunately, we don't yet have that reality. And so we continue to have public hearings so that you, the public, the experts, the scientists can tell us why we must not allow hydrofracturing in New York State. Thank you, Tony. Another squadron. You know, it's a funny thing the way that this issue has developed over the last few years. I remember uh, maybe four or five years ago, uh, it was an inevitability that, of course, uh, we wanted to have fracking and as quickly as possible until just a few people, probably even a fraction of those in this room, started to raise some alarms and concerns. And in that time, the evidence has rolled in. And those few people, those canaries in the coal mines or whatever sort of animal you have at the bottom of a fracking well, uh, were proven to be correct and, and really prophetic in uh, their understanding of some of the side effects. And today we're in a situation where there's some good news. There is a growing consensus that there is no way that fracking should be done in the New York City watershed, that it's just too important. That's great news, but the other side of that coin is uh, a little bit strange. If it's not safe enough for the New York City watershed, why is it safe enough to do anywhere? Why is it safe enough for the Delaware watershed? Why is it safe enough for areas along the southern tier or in any county in New York State where you happen to have humans and communities and an ecology? So look, if we have locations that don't have humans, don't have an ecology, don't have communities, there might be a reason to do it there. But until we find those, I think it's clear there is no reason to rush into fracking. It doesn't make any sense. And thank goodness, four or five years ago, before the cry and the science had gotten to the level it is today, we didn't rush in. I just shudder to think what information, what science we'll have five years from now. Let's just hope it won't be too late. I really thank especially Senator Bella and all my colleagues, but Senator Bella in two offices now has been one of those creatures down at the bottom of the fracking well, uh, <laughs> trying the alarm. And your leadership and, and as, as a colleague is really uh, uh, deeply appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. We've also uh, been joined by Senator Montgomery. Senator. Thank you. Um, I also join my colleagues in thanking, uh, thanking Senator Avella for uh, leading our conference on this issue. Uh, it is one that is uh, extremely important to constituents that I represent, even though I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, and I think that we, we have been joined by people from around the state in expressing concern. I have certainly testified uh, before the uh, DEC and uh, made my positions known. I am absolutely against this hydrofracking. And um, I want to also thank the people in this room and those from across the state who have been in Albany uh, every week uh, to remind the governor and to remind the legislature that this is the number one environmental issue in our state uh, across political divide and across the, the regions in our state. So thank you, Senator Avella, and I'm, I look forward to hearing more from people who understand this issue and who are willing to put their lives on the line uh, to make sure that we do the right thing in the state of New York. So. Thank you, Senator Montgomery. Um, some of my colleagues have touched upon this, and, and I want to reemphasize. I believe this is the single biggest grassroots effort on one single issue that I have ever seen in New York State politics and government. And it's the fact that hydrofracking hasn't occurred yet is due to everybody in this room and those well beyond that. I mean, people all over this state are rising up. I happened to do a, a farm tour the past two days in Shenango County, and it was interesting to see the no fracking signs in front of people's homes all over uh, Shenango County. 
Um, we're going to win this battle at the end of the day, and it's going to be because of you, all of you. So, with that, uh, the first speaker is Thomas Cludere from the Environmental Working Group. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to be here to speak about New York's decision on whether to allow high volume hydraulic fracturing. A decision that will certainly have a profound impact on the Empire State for decades to come. My name is Thomas Clutteray, and I'm Assistant General Counsel for the Environmental Working Group, or EWG. For years, EWG has worked closely with citizens, public interest groups, and lawmakers at all levels of government to champion policies that protect public health and the environment. As I mentioned on the steps of City Hall last week, EWG has closely followed New York's fracking debate since 2008 when we were invited to testify before the New York City Council, raising concerns about the inherent risk of shale gas drilling. Like many others, we also submitted public comments to the DEC on its draft drilling plan, highlighting the plan's many critical flaws and scientific gaps. Taken together, the draft plan or its shortcomings make clear that New York is simply unprepared to make a decision on hydraulic fracturing at this time, or at least one that is informed by best science. Further, records EWG obtained from the DEC show that this lengthy review process may have already been compromised when the DEC gave gas drilling companies exclusive act to access to detailed rule proposals and draft permit language. That access gave drillers an opportunity to influence this rulemaking process weeks before the public even saw the draft rules despite pledges from the governor that this process would be fair and transparent. In one blatant example, a drilling industry attorney who represents Chesapeake Energy Corporation, among other oil and gas companies, used this opportunity to try to weaken testing requirements for radioactive pollution that might run off of drilling sites during heavy rains. As you would expect, the DEC has criticized EWG's inside track report, which brought this preferential treatment to light. The regulators say they've done nothing wrong by sharing these documents with oil and gas companies. According to them, it was not only justified, but necessary to meet their obligations under New York state law. Let me be clear, EWG has never suggested that the DEC engage in unlawful activity in this rulemaking process, and yes, we recognize that regulators have to develop cost estimates for the regulations and analyze how they will impact the subject industry. But nowhere in the law does it say regulators must share detailed rule proposals or specific permit language with the drilling industry outside of the public's eye behind closed doors. Nowhere in the law does it say regulators can cover themselves by citing vague language on the DEC's website, which simply says regulators have communicated with all sorts of stakeholders. Hardly a public acknowledgement that they have shared key documents with the drilling industry and only the drilling industry weeks in advance. And nowhere in the law does it say regulators must engage in preferential treatment and leave it up to public interest groups to file rec uh, records requests to reveal how the draft plan could be so tilted toward the drilling industry. We challenge the DEC to explain in detail how this behind the scenes dealing with the drilling industry is in fact necessary under New York state law. We also challenge the DEC and the governor's office for that matter to fill in glaring gaps in the records we obtained in response to our initial records requests. For example, we received emails in which regulators said they were going to send key documents to the drilling industry, but we never received copies of those transmissions themselves. We received documents mentioning meetings and phone calls with drilling representatives, but no records of what was said and what was done during those meetings and phone calls. I should add that we did not receive a single phone record generated in 2011 between seven members of the Cuomo administration and some nearly two dozen drilling companies and their representatives. I find it hard to believe that there were no such calls. As the New York Daily News reported on Sunday, the governor and his inner circle prefer to communicate using BlackBerry pen-to-pen -pen messaging if they cannot talk by phone. Unlike regular email, this leaves no real paper trail. Perhaps that explains the gaps in the records we received. If others in state government and the drilling industry are following the governor's example of conducting business in ways that cr uh, creates no permanent record. We may never know what has happened behind the scenes as the state's draft drilling plan makes its way to the governor's desk. As the governor said, however, this rulemaking process must be fair, transparent, and science-based. So far, it has not lived up to that standard not in the backroom dealing between the drilling industry and regulators, 
not in the state's badly flawed and unscientific draft plan, and not in the modified proposal the Cuomo administration floated last month in the New York Times. As you know, that plan would limit drilling to several counties along the Pennsylvania border or to areas where the Marcellus Shale is 2,000 feet below the surface, and the shale is at least 1,000 feet from any water supplies. Well, EWG has carefully reviewed thousands of pages in the draft plan, industry studies, and government reports. And we can find no scientific basis for the idea that these limitations would be sufficient to protect New York State's precious water supplies, as the Cuomo administration maintains. In fact, a variety of evidence suggests otherwise. A 1987 EPA report to Congress found that a shale gas well hydraulically fractured at a depth of more than 4,200 feet below the uh, contaminated water supply just 400 feet from the surface. Industry studies have found that oil and gas was routinely develop leaks that allow gas and potentially associated contaminants to migrate from the deep underground to the surface. The U.S. Geological Survey has found that rock layers above the Marcel Shale are already high, highly fractured by natural processes, providing pathways for contaminants to migrate upward into New York's water supplies. The Geological Survey has also found that New York officials don't even know where the locations of many of these underground water supplies are. Given the survey's concerns and its status as one of our leading scientific agencies, EWG would like to see the survey analyze Governor Cuomo's modified drilling proposal before any decision is made. As we've said before, New York cannot afford to be drilling first and asking these important questions later. New Yorkers deserve a plan that is backed by best science and a review process that is truly fair and transparent. Only then can Governor Cuomo know how and whether shale gas drilling can be conducted safely. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I'm sure my colleagues are going to have some questions. My first one is with respect to the fact that the proposed regulations were given to the oil and natural gas companies. Now, the state DC is apparently saying that they are mandated to do it. You mentioned that in your testimony. Um, have they said to you what section of the law required them to do that? Have they actually given you a section of the law? They responded to the Albany Times Union, which initially ran with our report, with a general sweeping statement about basically that they have to take this information to develop cost estimates, but they didn't cite specific provisions of, of the law, the State Administrative Procedure Act. Um, and certainly, uh, I'm not a New York attorney, but looking at that law, just because they have to develop cost estimates doesn't mean they have to proceed with this kind of discretion to allow this kind of backroom uh, dealing as far as we are concerned. I agree with me, but wouldn't you say this is a huge conflict of interest for the state to give proposed regulations to an industry that they are going to later regulate? Absolutely. The very idea that for months we were under the impression that everybody got to see these draft rules at the same time and to submit comments through this process. Uh, and then we find out, uh, we, the report we had and we were finally able to pull everything together came out in June, that's months later to realize that not only were the drilling industry representatives seeing these documents before the rest of us got a bite at the apple, they were having an opportunity to try to weaken the standards or the permit, for example, to remove testing requirements for radioactive pollution, which we've seen it can be highly carcinogenic. Questions? Uh from my colleagues who wants to go for it? Uh, Senator Kruger. Um, just for the record, I, when we um, when we learned about this through your foil, which I appreciate very much, we also, a number of us wrote to the DEC asking for an explanation, a justification, and an understanding of what might have changed between their initial draft that went to the industry and the actual draft that the rest of us got to see. For the record, we haven't gotten a response yet. Sure, and, I, and I'll say, although the testing requirements for radioactive pollution are still there in the draft permit, given these gaps in the documents we did receive, we and the fact that this plan is so tilted toward the drilling industry, we have many lingering questions about what else may have been happening there. And, and we'll continue to ask those questions and hope that the department will provide those answers. Perkins. So have you had an opportunity to share your concerns uh, with the governor? We, we, have, we have not reached out directly to the governor. Um, 
and, we, and we've not received a response to him so far. We did uh, follow up with additional freedom of information law requests to address those apparent gaps. I think we sent an additional 10 to the department and the governor's office to try to close in some of those gaps. So this, I just want to be clear. So in your efforts to kind of get a sense of where the governor was coming from, uh, you contacted his staff or the agency, or how did you go about doing that? I get, we, the way we've done this is through our Freedom, freedom of Information, information. Law request. Okay. And so I noticed, you, 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 since you haven't had a chance to engage him, I'm just wondering why would the governor put himself in such a contradiction you know, in terms of allowing the industry to have access to certain information that normally wouldn't be allowed, the lack of transparency and accountability. What do you think is that? What do you I, think is his motivation here? I think at the very least, the governor should have questions for the very experts he's going to be relying on to inform this decision. And, and I'll leave it to the governor to do that re outreach and hopefully uh, the people of New York and lawmakers will ask those questions of the governor and his experts. Thank you. We've also been uh, joined by Senator Stuart Cousins. Um, I also, in addition to uh, Senator Kruger, sent a letter to the governor after this and DEC commissioner about this issue, asking for what section of the law requires the agency to do this, and similarly as you did, ask for copies of everything that was sent to the oil and natural gas companies. Um, I haven't received a response either. Uh, it's very disconcerting that the, that the agency that is supposedly supposed to protect the environment is in fact cooperating with the industry that we're very concerned about. It, it uh, leads one to believe what is moving the system. Is it the science or is it the money that the oil and natural gas companies are distributing throughout the system? Very disconcerting. Any final comments? No? I, I think as you pointed out a few moments ago, at the very least the fact that we have an apparent conflict of interest demands more answers before New York can proceed with this decision. Thank, thank you. And thanks for the good work that you're doing on this issue. Thank you. The next panel is uh, Chip Northrup and Ronald Bishop. I'm Chip Northrup. This must be Ron Bishop. <laughs> Dr. Ron Bishop. Uh, I was an oil and gas investor mainly in the offshore. Do you mind if I go first? Uh, in the oil and gas business for about 30 years, mainly owning um, uh, offshore and onshore oil rigs. We, uh, my lovely wife Nancy and I, summer up in Cooperstown, and I became involved in these issues when we when we moved up here. Uh, let me let me answer a, sort of the the question that you pose. And there's actually a pretty simple answer to the reason why the DEC is so conflicted. And by the way, I said I submitted a paper on this. In most states, in mo most oil and gas producing states, the environmental uh, regulatory task is separate from the minerals management task. Uh, in out of the out of the shale states, quote unquote, there's only four states. That, that combine that function into one agency. Uh, most states obviously uh, do not. And so what that, what that does is that gives the environmental task, or the environmental regulatory task, a fair shot at being independent and autonomous to the minerals management function. Uh, they not, it doesn't always play out that way. <laughs> but, excuse me. But that's that it gives them it gives them an opportunity. So so the the problem that you're faced with here in these foil documents indicate it is is that basically you you are functionally you're dealing with a minerals management agency. I mean it's called the DEC. It has nominally it has a, an environmentalist as its titular head. But it, you really in this in this regard at least for this activity uh, shale gas development you're you're you, you're dealing with a, a minerals management group. When you go to when we go as environmentalists um, to to see the DEC we we're we're ushered in to see Jack Dahl who's in, in charge of well permitting. You know and he just gives us a blank look because 
you know, water, you know, that's not his bailiwick. Same thing with Allison Crocker, the attorney that was in the colloquies with uh, Tom West. Uh, they're basically in the well permitting business. You know, God bless them. There's agencies to do that in other states, um, but they're not. They're not the, that activity or the the environmental activity is no not co-opted, uh, coerced, subordinated to the minerals management function because it's a separate agency. So, I mean, that's the problem, if you will. It's a structural problem. I'm not sure how it came about, but it would have to be fixed. Uh, because you, because the problem is you would never be able to disassociate the influence of the well permitting function, Jack Dahl, Allison Crocker, that gang, from the environmental regulatory, it, as long as they're under the same head. One of them is going to predominate and, you know, guess which one it's going to be. Uh, the, just to go over the, a couple of things, the, uh, to sort of to, to back that up. The, 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 as, a, as a for instance, and this goes back, based on these, these foiled emails, this goes back at least to 2005. Well, let's take 2008. West had a meeting with Jack Dahl. He had seven people from Chesapeake with him, March 26, 2008. He goes in there, and they, they were going to do the, the uh, spacing unit size, the size of the gas well spacing unit, uh, you know, as a draft. And they're also going to address the setback of a gas well from the property boundary. Well, so Chesapeake marches in there with seven attorneys, you know, to see Jack and to Allison, and, he, and they put down this 640 acres, a square mile, one section, as a spacing size, and they say, well, the, and, the, and the setback of the gas well from the property line would be 330 feet. Well, guess what? <laughs> uh, existing U New York regs that might have had an environmentalist involved with it, or a hydrologist, or a geologist, scientist, um, there, there was, it was up to 1,500 feet was a setback at the time. And of course, when, you know, when West and his compadres marched out of there, the, the DEC changed that, and now they proposed that in the S guys, magically, 1,500 feet went to 330 feet. There was no environmental review. And mind you, I'm not being cynical. I'm just telling you that there was no environmentalist there. There was no hydrologist, nobody to review it, to even say no. <laughs> it was okay with Dahl. He issues world permits. You know, God bless him. That's just one instance. This obviously the, the the compulsory integration law was written by West, who then teed up people to force them into wells. That was in 2005. Probably one of the worst laws, compulsory integration laws, in the United States. But more importantly, the way it's applied in New York is just flat wrong. I mean, they will force a guy, a, a man and his wife, into a well in their household on a 40-acre spacing. There's compulsory integration laws in other states, Texas. In Texas, maybe twice in the last 60 years is it applied. Only under exceptional circumstances is a compulsory integration law applied, even in other states that have a higher supermajority than New York. New York's got 60, most states have 70. Not so. The, the, the DEC has, has got a whole queue of compulsory integration cases lined up, and, the, and the, the applicant is represented by the same guy that wrote the law, Tom West. You know, I mean, I, yeah, I thought I'd seen it all in Louisiana, but this place tops the cake. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry, fella. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, but that's the way it is. Now, you know, they, the the question is that what they what they run for cover over is this Article 23 of the New York State Environmental Conservation Law. That's where it mandates or or yeah, mandates to maximize the efficiency of oil and gas extracted. Well, I mean, efficiency. Let's we're all for efficiency. Who's not? But this, but they take it as a, as a, a as a as sort of a that, that's basically their the running room to just go ahead and do whatever they want as a minerals management agency and basically turn the DEC into a minerals management agency and just drop the E you know the sort of inconvenient E out of their name. Uh, the, one other couple of things that you know they, they go around and they say they got well we've got the toughest <laughs> regulations in the country. Well, no, they don't. They're they're not good. The, as as Ronald pointed out, and as some other people point out, there the history of regulating gas wells in in New York State is is sorry. The the number of, of the number of wells that are actually inspected per year is about two thirds of the number that say be inspected in Texas. So the regulatory function is flawed. It's inadequate. It was it was actually audited in '92, and they and the DEC basically flunked flunked the audit. Let's talk about the regs. Uh, the, you know, they've had three iterations of this S-Guys, and, you know, 
thousand, eighty thousand comments and whatever, sixteen hundred pages, and all, all these hearings, and Ron and I waste our time in. Well, guess what? It, it, the the setback for a gas well in the state of New York is a hundred feet from a house. You can drill like one of these big. <clears throat> shale gas wells 100 feet from somebody's house, 150 feet from a church, 150 feet from a stream. That's the worst setback in the United States. There is no state, there is no county in out west where counties have zoning authority. There's no township anywhere that would have a setback that's that's, that's low. And these fellows have going to have the audacity to say that they have the you know New York just relax, trust us. You know we got the best toughest regs. No, no you don't. <laughs> Again, I don't know. I don't know where those came from, but basically, there is no. There's no science involved. You know, setback from a pond from a lake is zero. I mean, where's just there's no science there. It's just that's because what you know sounded like a good number for Chesapeake. The other one that this is kind of this is getting a little esoteric. I know I'm eating up on Ron's time here, but there's no seismic regulations in this state. In other words, you could shoot a seismic test, you could drill holes, bore hole, uh, stuff, pack it with dynamite, boom, and check the seismic. And there's no regulations where you can do that in this state, except on state lands. In other words, you could do that right next to a church. I mean, for all I know, you could do it in a cemetery. You know, kaboom. That's kind of odd, I must say, <laughs> um, particularly a cemetery. Um, like, for instance, in Louisiana, you can't shoot seismic within a thousand feet of a boat. And then, you know, you all, like, scratch your head. You know, they must be very fond of their boats. Well, because they shoot seismic in bayous. So, and you, that's be a dandy way to hold a boat. Not in New York, you know, any, just let it roll. Um, the obvious, and you're going to hear more f about this, but the, but the DEC basically went out of their way to ignore the, high, the hard science on this. I mean, you read the S guys, not only did they ignore it, but they basically took the industry line and they went back and they, not with the hard science, but they went back and they disputed the hard science that had been presented, particularly from Howarth and from Jackson, Osborne, and the Duke Methane study. They just took pot shots at it. It's the kind of pot shots that the industry would have taken. No, isn't that a surprise? Uh, the, and of course, as, as you as we know, the the um, the, the non-industry people don't really get to a hard look at these regs. They certainly don't get a meaningful uh, input. And and for instance, the, 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 the they 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 hired out the review of the of these eighty thousand comments to Alpha Engineering, among others. And Alpha Engineering was the group that they had hired to write the report. So, you know, they might give themselves an A, don't you think? <laughs> because the rest of us, you know, that's, we're going to get our, we're going to get our comments, Ron's well-considered comments will be reviewed by the same people that wrote the report. Gee whiz. Um, and the, uh, and well, I can go on. I, I, I've, I, but this, well, this is something too that first caught my eye. This is one of the few states in the United States that does not tax gas at the wellhead. And you know, the, the problem with that, there's a couple, one of them is, is that that means nobody's out there actually reading the meter. There's nobody from the state reading the meter that the state would get money off of. This, this stuff is 7.4% gas tax in Texas is 15% in Arkansas. It's zero in, um, in New York. And that's, there's, no, there's really no state that has any shale gas potential that is even now Pennsylvania that is devoid of the state revenue directly from the, and you know, the apologists say, well, New York is, oh, they're high taxes. We've got, well, we have high taxes. Well, you're missing one. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. It's a line on him on a run ticket. The state severance tax. Just let that roll off of your tongue. Uh, the, um, the, 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 the science, the, the, or the, sort of the environmental science, if you will, that's manifest in the S guys, is really a bunch of political payoffs. I, I should, I know that's the wrong term, I think, but I, what I mean is, is that, I'm sorry, no, 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 nothing impugned here, uh, is, is that the, um, is, is that, but, you, but I mean, it's directly a function of the number of voters affected. I mean, it's not just, you know, New York City's reservoirs, but it's, you can trace that all the way down to say the lowly organic dairy farmer who has you know base of voting the presence of zilch and and that's the, and you if you look at the setbacks for instance the protections in the S guide it's a direct function of population it's re it's really a remarkable piece of work you know some firm in Houston probably dreamed it up but that's but that is in fact the science in other words you could 
you could take those regs and you could match them up, correl correlate them with the number of people protected, and that is the science. It's political science. And, you know, I don't mean to insult any poli sci majors, but that's not science. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, the, this is a sort of an anecdote, but the revolving door at the DEC is basically uh, directly to the industry. I mean, there may be they may be out there, and I wish they would raise their hands. If, but we, Ron and I, don't run into any ex DEC employees, you know, on the anti fracking circuit. You know, it's there all the people we run into, or the the fracking shills, if you pardon the expression, ma'am are ex-DEC employees, and that's because they're minerals management people, like they would be in Colorado, the, you know, or in Texas at the Railroad Commission. That's understandable. But there's no, there, there no, there's no revolving door for an, for an environmentalist. The fact that they have an environmentalist, you know, as their figurehead is, it's, well, you know, that's good for. So, uh, let, me, let me make some suggestions, if I may. Uh, your your assembly colleagues, I think, might might want to subpoena these people. I think you know if they don't answer your questions. Well, come tell Mama. <laughs> you know, bring it on. I think they need to be subpoenaed. I think what you'd find is you'll confirm what basically what these FOIL documents is 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 that you have the you basically have colloquies of as if they were legal colleagues in the same firm between a minerals management agency, which in fact would have these, this dialogue uh, with the industry that it regulates. It's not out of the question, but that it is exclusive in that regard. It's exclusively a colloquy between the industry and the permitting function of that agency to the exclusion of any environmental review. I think obviously you need to, you know, enter the 21st century and have a separate res a natural resource. You know, call it the Bureau of Mines or some damn darn thing. But I mean, that's the normal. That's the normal thing to do is you, se you separate it out. You put it under the revenue or permitting, whatever. Put it back where it was, I suppose. The obvious, you have to have an autonomous uh, environmental agency that doesn't have any business in the permitting or, or even the, the, or the technical regulations of the drilling and fracking itself. Got to have a severance tax. I mean, that's just silly. Uh, you got to respect home rule. It's the law in every other state, you know, uh, even in Texas. Um, <laughs> You, 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 and you know, you've got to get rid of this compulsory integration law. It just tees people up to get pushed into well. It's, it, it really rubs me the wrong way. And that's what i got to say for myself. Thank you. I think it would be uh, helpful just for you to state your background in the oil. Okay. Yeah, I kind of glossed over that. Um, I, was a, um, I was a planning manager at Atlantic Ridgefield at ARCO um, in the late 70s. I, I had a company, uh, the, or I was a co-founder, co-owner of a company that we sold to Atlanta Richfield. Subsequently, in, a, in 80, 1986, I started investing in oil and gas rigs, oil and gas drilling rigs, mainly offshore rigs. And I was in, invested in those, um, a series of rigs up until 2006. And then I have owned oil and gas production in the states of New Mexico and Texas. The rigs are all over the world. But, the, but just as a for instance, the rigs were subject to Coast Guard regulations. The oil and gas properties were subject to the BLM, to the feds, to the state of New Mexico, the state of Texas, county rigs. So, and, and, in no t and this was all before the EPA got fracked out of the oil and gas business in 2005. So everything, in some, some of those properties would have maybe three or four regulatory agencies, including the, the EPA. And that is typical in, out west. In fact, I think, in the, there's, I think in maybe the record is like California where there's six regulatory agencies that, would, that have, have supervision over uh, oversight over oil and gas drilling. So that's probably a good place to start, is to bifurcate that activity. And like you say, to put this in perspective, if, if that doesn't happen, then you just really should not be doing this here. You know, if this was out in, out in the bleak West Texas, it'd be another thing. There's nobody living out there and whatnot, and no wells to pollute. But it's not. <laughs> the hydrological and topographical setup scenario in this state is just terrible. <laughs> to be doing this sort of thing. 
exactly. and frankly, if if you know if there was any part of Texas that even halfway looked like this, it, they you wouldn't be doing we wouldn't be doing it. You know. Thank you. Um, Senator Squadron has a question. Just just very briefly, yes, I know we've got uh, kind of just two two items. Mm -hmm. Any uh, estimate on what a severance tax could uh, net the state? No. Well, I, well, right now it'd be kind of a big vet zero because you know that's another thing about this is that this is a real roller coaster uh, revenue source. And by and I didn't we didn't get into this, but none of these shale none of these dry shale gas wells would be economic in this state at this time. This is dry methane. None of these wells would be economic. There would be no ad valorem tax paid to a lo local uh, prop, uh, local municipalities because they're all a function of the profitability of the well and they would be shut in. So, I mean, not to be facetious, uh, although it comes easily to me, uh, they, it would be just, it would be close to zero. You see, the, because it, it's really based on the productivity. Like, for instance, the severance tax in Texas, it's a net present value of the well. And if it's unproductive at this point, there it was shut in. It'd be, it'd be like zero. But 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 I mean, it could be. You know, if at five percent, on the other hand, at ten dollars an MCF, it could be a lot of money. And it's certainly it, it, and it's and it's a functionally a necessary amount of money. Or you have no money to pay for the state roads. You have no money to pay for the the fifteen regulators that the DEC has. You know, you got, anyway, excuse me. So, and just the other, you, a lot of different states got thrown out there. I think we all noted that we're worse than Louisiana and uh, sadly. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I mean, to, I don't mean to offend it. It's a convenient not, whipping boy for Texans. Not, <laughs> it works in New York too. So, uh, but, but quite seriously, a lot of different states. If you were to compare New York's regulatory and oversight structure. Yeah. Uh, in terms of both effectiveness and independence. Right. To another state in the union. Uh-huh. What state would that be and why? Or is I, well, I would probably Belize. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, union. No, Belize. I, wouldn't you say Belize? No. <laughs> Columbia, maybe. So, the, so, there, so none of the other forty. No. Well, well, first of all, let me say that that's that's addressed, not not that's addressed in this in this paper. And we'll it's it. because it compares the thirty-one quote shale states, the regulatory structures of thirty-one stale, shale states. If you if you throw in the uh, you know the lack of a severance tax, which is important because absent a severance tax, you have no revenue. So, so New York just <laughs> it'd be it'd be pretty much at New the York bottom. is the single worst probably in terms of oversight and independence in the nation, in your view. I think so. Yeah, you'd, uh, you, I, I haven't seen it, if you put all those factors together. I don't see there's nobody that'd be any worse. I don't think. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Kruger now has a question. Yeah. No, no, no. You can, she has one more question. Oh, yes, ma'am. All right. So your follow-up to Senator Squadron's question about how much we could make off a severance tax and the point that mines could, um, these wells really couldn't be profit-making at this point leads me to the follow-up question. Some people have suggested that this whole exercise in New York State right now is sort of akin to... Um, mortgage purchase sale debacle uh, trades and that Chesapeake and some of the other companies who originally went into contracts with landowners to have the rights to drill is really a business exercise in itself now leading to flipping so to speak or group sales of the rights do you have, I mean, you were shaking your head, so maybe I should have waited till Ron until you got to testify, but do you have an opinion about, like, the business model of what's really going on here? It's a Ponzi scheme, ma'am. That's basically, um, the, what happens in New York was, is, and Deborah Rogers has really done some really good work on this, is, is it, it was, in fact, a land flipping exercise and the and the econo the fin financing of it was was actually facilitated when they changed the SEC rules in 2008 and basically what it did was is it enabled you to like make up any value that you wanted for your reserves so you go out you tie up a lot of land you basically try and lease land from some dude in a beard driving a buggy and uh, for nothing which is what they did and um, 
and then you would you would drill you would find a well drill a a test well that pick your best well then you go get a Netherlands sewer or some you know reservoir engineer down in Houston to give your assets on uh, your reserves a big value and then you sell, float junk bonds against it or you'd sell stock or whatever so it was you know it, it was it was kind of a scam it is kind of a scammy deal it's not that all of these wells are uneconomic it's just that the overall financing structure it, it's like not like you know some mortgages are good but but there is the preponderance of it was um, a scam which is why basically Chesapeake collapsed you know and um, among other reasons, the thing that the thing obviously that tripped it up was is all that works as long as the price of gas goes up. As you as the price of gas goes back, then you then all this is basically exposed. The 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 you know the falsehoods of it are exposed. So so yeah, it's kind of, it was kind of a scam, and particularly here in New York where they tied up a bunch of land. Let me just one quick point about that. Senator Grisanti tried to increase the the well spacing from one square mile to two square miles. The reason why Chesapeake wanted him to do that was is because you can you can hold the acreage uh, with one well. So in other words, if you increase the spacing unit size to 1,280 two two square miles, then basically you could hold the leasing of of uh, of with just one with just one well, that's kind of that's not so good. That's that's in the that's in the that's in the um, the, the gas industry's favor to do that. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, Thank you, sir. We really appreciate your testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, hi. Um, I'm Ron Bishop. I'm probably not going to be as flamboyant as Chip. Oh, <laughs> rascal. <laughs> Um, Speak closer into oh, the mic. Sure. Um, now, um, a little about me. I was born in Ohio, actually born in the city of Youngstown. You might have heard of that. <laughs> Although there's no reason other than earthquakes lately that anyone should have heard of it. Um, um, I, uh, I, did a, I got my bachelor's degree in chemistry from Youngstown State University. Uh, and then I moved from Ohio to West Virginia to get a job. Not everybody can say that. Um, after managing a laboratory at the medical school for a couple of years, I was strongly encouraged to apply myself. And, and so then uh, a few years later, they kicked me out with a PhD degree from the West Virginia University School of Medicine. Following that, um, I, um, I did postdoctoral work uh, with a contractor for the National Cancer Institute at Fort Detrick, Maryland. Uh, for several years. Um, and then after that I went to work for a biotechnology company, especially working on biosafety issues, especially viruses and so forth. Um, uh, and during that time, realizing that I, I had liked the contact with the interns and students and all that sort of thing that I did not get with the biotech industry, I also um, went back to night school for education to make an intentional conversion from full-time research to full-time teaching. And I've been then doing full-time teaching since then. I currently teach chemistry and biochemistry at the State University of New York at Oneonta. That'll handle those sorts of questions for you. Now, how did I get into this mess? Um, about four and a half years ago, um, some friends of mine in a very new at that time group called Sustainable Atsigo heard of an industry like this, the shale gas industry, coming our way and they asked me if I knew anything about it, thinking that since I lived in an area with a lot of minerals extraction before, I might. Well, I didn't. Uh, and I started looking around myself, who, you know, who can teach me about this industry, who can tell me what to expect. Um, because they tapped me, not only because I'm an academic, you know, with chemistry and biochemistry, but I'm also a construction professional. Um, a commercial industrial electrician with quite a few years of experience working my way through school. So um, I actually at that time went to the only people I knew who could, could teach me, um, the people at Schlumberger, Halliburton, BJ Well Services and the like. And I learned an awful lot about the gas and oil business from them. I've learned a lot more in the meantime from a good friend of mine, uh, Lou Alstadt, a retired vice president of uh, Mobile Oil Com Corporation, who acts, is a friend and a neighbor, and his wife and I sing in a group locally. <laughs> so this is sort of my exposure to the industry, you know, as of about 2008. 
And along the way, I decided to take, started to try to take a hard look at, okay, well, what's the science? What can we expect? You know, using my tools as a scientist, as a chemist, you know, what can I find out of what's been going on? Um, I'd heard a lot of hand waving on both sides, and I hadn't picked one. And um, uh, I can make that longer story shorter. I've picked one now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, what is it? <laughs> for the for the record, um, those who say that hydraulically fracturing with horizontal high volume, high pressure, you know, um, hydraulic fracturing for uh, for to re extract oil and gas from from uh, unconventional resources, those who say it can be done safely, have yet to demonstrate a single location where that's been shown. So when when I've looked for the place where that's kind of fun, so, some, somebody somebody's leaning against the light switch. Can you repeat that again? Sure. Um, I have heard it said by others that um, extraction of oil and gas through horizontal, high volume, high pressure hydraulic fracturing. And then in subsequent recovery of the con of the resources from unconventional, you know, um, reservoirs can be done safely. I have not found a single location in the world where that is actually true. And we now have a lot of locations in the world where that's been going on for almost 10 years. So I follow the data, and the and the the, the results, the evidence tells me. It can't be done safely. It hasn't been done safely. Now, what I want, and I've done some writing on the subject. I did, um, um, a, in my terms, uh, a scoping document white paper that I called a chemical and biological risk assessment for che for a natural gas extraction in New York. And if you haven't received a copy, I'll make sure you have at least an electronic one before I go. And subsequent to that, um, I started developing different sections of that white paper for a special study. And as a result of that, I actually did provide uh, some of you um, at your uh, Canandaigua meeting, although I wasn't able to attend because my teaching load prevented me. I talked about the history of oil and gas well abandonment in New York State. And to me, the upshots of that history were that in the 1970s, when um, DEC records were first beginning to be kept. We had our best um, reported success in enforcing industry compliance for plugging abandoned wells. And that, and that rate at that time was 24 percent. Through the 1980s and 90s, uh, their success rate in enforcing compliance and plugging inactive wells dropped by half to 12 percent. And then in the 2000s, it dropped by half again to 6%, where we are today as an average. So we see a DEC that is actually at an all-time record low point for actually uh, enforcing compliance on one of the most important aspects of the industry. Now, what I want to focus on for you today is just two case studies that say there's a little bit more uh, uh, trouble in Houston. I'm going to talk about two instances of pretty traditional um, vertical w well projects fouling New York homeowners' water wells. You may or may not have actually heard about the details. I picked these two case studies because they're very interesting from a couple perspectives and they're very well documented. Another thing that is a little bit unusual because um, I find that for most of these kinds of incidents, our um, DEC is very good at efficiently sweeping the stuff under the rug. But here's two that got away from them. And I'll just introduce them to you, and I'll leave uh, your, your people, possibly Rebecca, with all kinds of uh, paperwork if she'd like to follow up, possibly with the offices of the Inspector General. Or maybe you'd like to subpoena some of these people. In, the, in um, the February of 2009, the David Eddy family noticed that there was a, a ring of new natural gas wells going in around their property. Um, and uh, they could hear, the, of course, the, the, the logging and all of the other preparatory steps. They could you know, see all of the trucks that were related to the grading of the well pads. And, and then they knew when frack week came because they could hear the uptick in the uh, uh, 
uh, in the business. Now, these are a lot smaller and more um, compact kinds of projects, but there were four of them in a ring around this family's home about um, from, from a, as near as about uh, 330 feet to as far as about 1,500 feet away. And they were all being developed by U.S. Energy Development Corporation, which, although it's not based in the state, has a major office in Getzville, just north of uh, Buffalo. Um, they noticed a big change in their water on frack week. And again, these guys were, were do, uh, operating fairly sensible, that is to say, uh, bring the uh, well services companies in all at one time to do four very close together wells. That's just good, a good business model. Um, but the Eddy family called everybody. They called the county you know, health department, um, the environmental branch at the time headed by Tom Hull, and they also, of course, called uh, the DEC. And the, um, um, the, the agent who's most active out there in Region 9 in that part of the region would be uh, Brian Jandrew, and his boss is Chris Miller. You may know Chris um, because of being having been reprimanded just this last year by the Office of the Inspector General for failing to divest himself of his fam of uh, management of his family's oil and gas business before taking a supervisory role with DEC. But I'll let you guys work that out. <laughs> um, U.S. Energy came and did their own well water testing. Um, they also invited Culligan from nearby Bradford, uh, Pennsylvania, to come and do some well water testing for this family. Um, uh, the company, uh, U.S. Energy's wild water test showed nothing wrong. And uh, the Culligan Company's water test showed something was wrong. There was a, they, they found traces of oil and, and oil byproducts in, in the water well, um, the kind that didn't belong there. And a follow-up sampling by uh, the um, uh, Allegheny County um, uh, health department also found some, some of these problems with the well. And this is what the family was complaining about, bad odor, bad smell, it tasted like you know, gasoline. This is, by the way, very strange. This is not the kind of damage you expect from a gas well anywhere, particularly not the fairly dry gas wells because the targets out in their part of the state are typically the, the Medina sandstones. These Medina sands live below the Marcellus but above the Utica, and it's believed that it's the Utica that's actually the uh, source of the uh, resources that are in the Medina sands. But they're dry gases. They're not very many of the um, you know, um, uh, wet hydrocarbons that have to be purified away from them. And in fact, across wide swaths of the state, Medina wells, um, uh, the, our DEC permits um, um, companies like um, uh, uh, Lenape Resources to actually uh, market the gas without any post-processing except for separation from the brine. So that's really dry gas. So how did the Eddy family get oil into their water well? Where would that have come from? This is a big mystery. It's a mystery that Brian Dran Jandrew spoke about at length with a landowner's coalition head who went out to visit him, but he wouldn't talk to me when I uh, called him on the phone. I found that interesting. Um, and his best guess was, well, there was an abandoned well in, the, in between the Eddy family and this arc of new gas wells being developed. And on frack day, when they, of course, uh, were able to, you know, send out, you know, uh, these uh, hydraulic fractures in the Medina sandstone, which are targeted to go two to 500 feet, you know, the occasional one gets away and goes for half a mile, might have intersected with this abandoned well. Now, no search for an abandoned well was ever conducted that I could find any documentation for. And as I mentioned, Brian Jandrew wouldn't speak at any length with me about it when I called him on the phone. So shortly, at, now U.S. Energy, while saying they had nothing to do with the Eddy, Eddy's water well problems, installed for the Eddy family a carbon, water treat, carbon filter water treatment system. And they also offered the Eddy family a cash payment if they would sign a non-disclosure agreement. He took the filter um, system, but he, he said no to the cash. And that's one reason it's as well documented as it is today. Well, this was um, this all happened out in about 2009, and the wrap-up that I could see from the county health department documents and the U.S. Energy documents was about August or September of 2009, and I hadn't heard anything more. So, I decided to foil request um, a final disposition, you know, a final like investigative report from the DEC. You know, well, what did you decide? 
I filed this with the DEC in, on August 15th of 2011. And I received from the DEC that disposition letter, dated September 8th, 2011. <laughs> so when you ask for a final report, they'll get around to writing one. <clears throat> and the conclusions of this letter basically said, well, it's an incontrovertible, it, it's highly probable that natural gas development was responsible for fouling the Eddy family's water well. But because we don't know which of the four wells being developed near their home was the culprit, we can't assign blame or anything like that. And so uh, when the Eskice was being written and they said, well, there have been no incidents across the state to, to speak of, they didn't speak of that one because it was inconclusive. But if you like that, you'll love this one. <coughs> um, um, the, um, the family of David Ferugia lives in Cayentone Township, um, uh, Chautauqua County. That's just south of Jamestown. And they built on 22 acres a new house out there in 2001. They had a new well put in, and of course it, they had it um, analyzed you know, uh, at, at the time they put it in. It wasn't just a sale, like with the Eddy family who brought, bought their property in 2003, but it, they did the whole you know, ball, ball of wax with that. They heard that some new gas development was coming into their neighborhood soon, so they then did a pre drilling baseline water quality study on their water well. And in fact, the, uh, the local driller uh, participated with that. Um, now, the, the local driller had a, about three wells within about a thousand feet of the Ferugia family. Although in the paperwork, um, Jack Dahl and Chris Miller only ever reference one of them, the one that's three, about 330 feet away. Um, and that seemed to be all that they were interested in. But a couple of years after the initial development of this, you know, gas, uh, this uh, series of gas wells, well, a couple of years after the, after the one development of the one gas well that our uh, you know, investigators they would talk about, actually just a couple of months after the uh, development of the others, the Ferugias noticed some very big problems, you know, that had come about with their water well. Um, it was tasting salty, it had a sulfur-like smell, um, and it was making them sick. They called, the, um, they called everybody, they called the Chautauqua County uh, Health Department, uh, the water quality specialist there, Bill Boria, is the guy on the scene. Uh, they also, of course, called the, um, um, the DEC, and you know, Region 9 officials, once again, are, are, are on the scene for that. And the water quality specialist there um, did a couple of tests, and, and he determined that their well water had gone up dramatically from its earlier tests, dramatically in terms of methane content, chlorides content, um, and, and also a, a couple of the heavy metals that are associated, you know, typically with the, the brines of gas drilling. And so he thought that it was highly probable that gas d development had actually been responsible for somehow messing up the, this cup, you know, this family's water well. And he also recommended that do not try to use the water. He reported his results by means of this uh, memorandum of understanding between the county health department there and Region 9 of our DEC's Bureau of Oil and Gas Regulation that the first initial investigations are often done by the county health department. And they looked at his uh, rel relatively exhaustive paper, which I have for you here, 15 pages, and I won't read it to you. Um, and um, they disagreed. Um, they thought his, um, um, uh, they, they mentioned some anomalies of the hydrogeology there. They mentioned some, uh, uh, some things they just didn't, they didn't feel convinced. We don't know why. They said the timing seems to be off. And after all, the, big, the first thing that the Ferugias seemed to be complaining about was bacteria problem. Although I have to say, when they tested for coliform bacteria, it wasn't coliform bacteria. It was some other kind. Um, then the USGS um, out in that area, which had been copied on the correspondence between the DEC and the county health department, weighed in and said, I don't think either of you has quite enough information to call it a slam dunk with gas well development or to say that it wasn't related to gas well development. 
And there was then a follow-up by Bill Borea, who, who answered a lot of the points made by both the USGS people and also by the you know, DEC, uh, Chris Miller and Jack Dahl. Uh, among other things I should mention to you about is that Bill Borea has been their water quality specialist there for 27 years. <clears throat> He's not new to the area or the science. And, and as a final disposition, what I want to mention is that um, some of the things that the DEC people were complaining couldn't happen, couldn't happen, was, for example, this sort of this, this idea of bacterial contamination. It must be their septic field, their leach fields, or something like that. And Bill Borea described in detail, because of being with the county, he had all the records. There's no possible way for their septic system and leach fields. And besides, the bacteria that showed up weren't coliform. Actually, I can tell you, based on the fact that they smelled hydrogen sulfide, we know what kind of bacteria they were. They're an ancient life form called Archaea, and uh, their name is probably Desulfovibrio desulfuricans. And when you do top hole drilling, as is, is as common in the state of New York, with no biocides, with no actually no drilling mud at all, mostly with compressed air and a little bit of glycol ethers for foaming uh, agents. <clears throat> You go down about 100 feet past, you know, deeper than the nearest usable water well, and then you pull all your rigging up to set the surface casing. And that's when the bacterial contamination happens. The bacteria that are on your drilling rig that you went down to, say, uh, 800 or 900 feet, depending on what the nearest usable water was in the area, often encounters these zones that are rich in these sulfate-reducing bacteria. And then when you bring them up into a freshwater aquifer, they take off, at least in the bottom of, of the aquifer where there isn't as much oxygen. And the difference, of course, is that if you, con if you contaminate someone's underground water, drinking water with chemicals, you've got a bad problem for the next few hundred years. But if you contaminate them with a biological, you're done. They don't, they not only don't get diluted out, they multiply. That's what, you know, bacteria like to do. And, and so the color of the Ferrugia family's water, the dark gray that was showing up in their toilet, and the odor from the water, the sulfate, you know, reducing bacteria's production of hydrogen sulfide, is a pretty good indicator that we know what kind of archaea was in there. And there's only one way to get that in there, neighboring drillers following the waterway, not chemically, but biologically. Over and over again, I have attempted to provide this information, this kind of information, this academic qualifier to the DEC for the last four years, that this is an aspect of the drilling industry they need to be careful of. They have not returned any of my messages. They have not returned my papers either, so I'm hoping that they read them. But what I'm seeing is that they have access to people who've done research, who've been looking hard at the you know, independent scientists. It's on my dime. I'm doing all of this. But I'm not getting the same kind of access. I see um, people like Chesapeake and Nornu and Range getting to our DEC. So I just put that out there. This is the science, though, that we have, is that our agency is trying to look better than they are by sweeping some things under the rug. And you might like to question them on that. Thank you. Go. Um, do we have copies of those? Can you provide us with copies? I'll give you. I I, I didn't I didn't have time to make a lot of copies. I have this copy. If you can email them, I have them a thumb too. drive that I can provide you with un, lots of wonderful stuff. Right. So I'll, I'll be happy to leave those here for you. Questions? No. Thank you. Your testimony was great. Thank you. Oh, Senator Montgomery has a question. I, I just Could wanted to ask. Well, actually, this is. Uh, uh, from the testimony of uh, uh, Mr. Northrop, um, but you may be able to oh, answer it. We'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, Although, I believe it or not, I don't usually speak for Chip. <laughs> <laughs> I just, um, he talked about the fact that there are no, uh, no regulations in terms of setback, the number of uh, uh, setback of a well from a homeowner's property or a home? He, he said there are no setbacks for seismic testing. For, okay. Well. I, and I can, by the way, attest to that because I happen to live in a town you may have heard of. That's Middlefield in Otsego County. And um, Gastem actually start, set off some dynamite charges at 7 a.m. one morning in the hillside on the hill overlooking my home 
Um, they hadn't told anybody that they were going to do that, but well, we all figured it out really soon. So yeah, we, actually the, the deal that there's no real setback, there are also apparently no local um, warning requirements for seismic testing. Because we, our first warning was the dynamite. Although it was very effective. <laughs> um, well, actually, the, Chip is going to come back. Oh, if you okay. oh good. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the, the uh, regulations on setbacks and the, the, the way that, um, that uh, <coughs> homeowners' property, uh, the, the, the mortgage on a homeowner's property may be voided uh, based on the fact that a well is not far enough <coughs> from that property? Right. Uh, but the insurance and the homeowner's mortgage? <coughs> yes, ma'am. That's um, um, Beth Ratto is an attorney, and she's going to testify about that specifically in a minute. I'm not an attorney, nor do I play one on YouTube, but it's pretty simple. Um, the the problem is is that the the setback in this state is is to from a, of a gas well of a I mean a drilling rig from a house is less than what the FHA or the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac guidelines would be. So the the, the and that's just uh, it's a little it's that's about as simple as it as it can get. But the problem is is that you could drill a well under the DEC regs that would just Post your uh, your mortgage because you'd be in violation of the loan covenants of the mortgage. It would also, as I think Senator Avila said earlier, it would also void your warranty. Uh, I mean your uh, your insurance. So uh, there, the 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 problem is is that again is the regulations in this state are so bad that uh, they, they wouldn't pass muster at Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, in the secondary mortgage market, or, or in the insurance uh, industry, in the home, homeowner's insurance industry. Next panel may be actually be able to go better to that question. Yeah. Senator Stewart Cousins, yes. wait a second. Yes, yes. I, I, just I just wanted, wanted to thank, thank you. Professor, before you go, oh, I, I, I was um, really, really uh, and thank, thank you, Senator Abella, for, for, for pulling, pulling us together, together so that, that once again, again we can hear uh, the concerns, the, the fears, and once again, not have anyone uh, who could tell us any different. So based on what you were saying, I've written your quote, you were saying that I have not found a single location in the world that that is actually true uh, when it comes to the safety of this process. Is that what you said, right? That is, that, that's what I said in uh, uh, the whole world. Well, yeah, my, my, my writing has been focused on New York, but my initial look at the, the business of the shale oil and gas business had me looking at um, work sites in Croatia, you know, Sweden, Norway, uh, Poland, uh, UK, um, uh, as well as in the U.S., Canada, um, Nigeria, and, and so on. And there are problems everywhere, um, and, and, and they're, they're profound. Um, uh, some of the problems, <coughs> some of the states have managed by means of a combination of regulations and enforcement to, to, uh, to encounter different problems than others. Uh, for example, the state of Michigan has a fairly shallow shale, the Antrim Shale, and you would think that they would have had more groundwater contamination than other states because their shale is actually closer to the surface and, and, and more pro problematic to keep away from groundwater. Um, as a matter of fact, more of the problems in Michigan because they, they realized that they had a real issue with their shallow resource. Um, they they stepped up their um, uh, uh, enforcement activity of fourfold. They uh, they put a lot of money into the project, um, and they've still had problems. And um, there are a couple of major uh, documents, are, are actually video documentaries. One of them um, it, with the not so fetching name "Journey of the Forsaken." Um, uh, that comes from Michigan, but the biggest problems that they've actually had were with uh, uh, companies drilling un, uh, 
unregistered, unlicensed pipelines. Uh, the, the most intensive drilling in Michigan has been the, in the North Woods. Actually, the most intensively drilled county in Michigan is Otsego County, a cruel twist of fate for me, because I live in Otsego County, New York. But getting through the North Woods is actually very difficult, and so they've just been basically plowing up stream banks to lay pipelines and things like that. So if you, you can pick your, your, your different area, and, and you have a different range of problems depending on the success or the failures of their regulatory regime. Um, the biggest problems with air quality seem to have been encountered in Pennsylvania, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, Colorado and Wyoming. Uh, but uh, Kansas has also had profound problems with air quality. Uh, people that I have met who, who are from there say, well, you know, how, just how, how long can you hold your breath driving up the highway? You don't even have to live next to the stuff. So no, I, I, there has, I, there's not a single place in the world um, where this has been you know, attempted at any uh, level of intensity where the industrializ industrialization hasn't gotten away from them. The scale of the step change in the industry, more than any other aspect of it, is what takes people by surprise. When you step up from developing a well with 80 to 100 thousands of fluids, and now you need 5 million gallons of fluids, that step change of 50 fold is unsustainable. They, basically, you know, you might get away with it once or twice, but by the time your 10th well is in, somebody's been hurt. And it's just been the Oh, all over the world, that's what we've seen consistently. And I, I know that we have another panel, so I won't yeah. give you. So uh, I, I just wanted to say that you you are saying that depend, no matter what, there's a problem. And in New York, our ability to regulate is the lowest at, at the lowest capacity possible. Right. So even with the best regulations, which I don't believe we have, and you can default the chip on that, although I've studied them too, even with the best regulations, uh, without the boots on the ground, we're doomed. And when we don't have boots on the ground, and we know what happens to uh, DEC commissioners that ask for more resources from the governor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I know we're uh, sort of taking a little bit more time with these first couple of panels, but I think as you'll agree, their testimony has been very important. The next panel is Elizabeth Radow and Jeanette Barth. Okay. So, um, okay, I think I'm, I'm going to start, correct? Thank you for inviting me to testify. I'm an economist and I've been developing, I'm Jeanette Barth. <laughs> I am an economist and I've been developing economic models and conducting economic analyses for over 35 years. For over three years, I've been dedicating much of my time to investigating the potential economic impact of shale gas development in New York. I have no financial interest related to shale gas development other than as a New York State taxpayer, landowner, and citizen. It's very clear that biased and inaccurate information is being spread by the gas industry. And the press and our own DEC are repeating the false claims. Our decision makers in both Albany and Washington may be relying on this misinformation. Independent researchers not funded by the gas industry reach vastly different conclusions from the industry-funded studies. The studies funded by the gas industry exaggerate benefits and ignore significant costs. They often use exaggerated reserve and production estimates, thereby overstating projections of jobs, income, and tax revenue. They ignore costs to communities, such as the costs associated with increased truck traffic, costs associated with increased demands on fire departments, police, hospitals, and social services. They ignore the fact that extractive industries are known for creating short-term booms followed by long-term busts. Industries that are not compatible with an industrial landscape or with potential water, air, and land contamination are likely to decline in the region. 
In New York State, examples of such industries that are vital to the region include agriculture, organic farming, tourism, outdoor recreation, winemaking, and hunting and fishing. And crowding out of many businesses is likely as well, leaving economically devastated communities down the road. Just look to Appalachia as an example of this. An ignored opportunity cost to upstate communities is the loss of future development as vast networks of pipelines are built, ruling out future building and economic development over or adjacent to the pipelines after the gas industry and its short-term jobs leave the area in a few years. We have recently learned that at least one major insurance company is unwilling to insure against the unique risks associated with fracking. If one cannot get a residential mortgage due to industrial activity on the property, or if one cannot get homeowner's insurance, or if drinking water becomes contaminated, home values and consequently property tax revenue may plummet. The limited and incomplete economic assessment done for the DEC SGEIS suffers the same fatal flaws of the industry funded studies. Benefits are exaggerated and significant costs are ignored. And by the way, Eugene Leff with the DEC told me that the public will not be given a chance to comment on future revisions to the economic assessment. One of the studies not funded by the industry concludes, and I quote, counties that have focused on energy development are unperforming economically compared to peer counties that have little or no energy development. And a peer-reviewed article concludes, the areas of the United States having the highest levels of long-term poverty tend to be found in the very places that were once the site of thriving extractive industries. And another one concludes that there is clear evidence that resource-dependent counties in the United States exhibit more anemic economic growth. I looked at data on unemployment rates, income levels, and poverty rates in counties in New York State where we have had conventional gas drilling for a long time. I also looked at similar data for counties in Texas where shale gas drilling has been going on for about a decade. These data support the peer-reviewed conclusions that residents in gas-intensive counties have overall not fared better than residents in other counties. Industry and government have touted shale gas as a means of lessening dependence on foreign energy sources and achieving a cheap and plentiful source for domestic energy consumption. Now it appears that the gas industry is seeking to export U.S. shale gas. Thus, we are putting in jeopardy the environment, public health, and economy of New York State in order to provide profits to the gas industry for supplying the economic development of China. That's not a trade I'd like to make. The oil and gas industry spends huge amounts of money on lobbying, political contributions, public relations, advertising, and even economic impact studies in order to spread falsehoods and hide the truth. Here is the truth. Extractive industries create boom and bust cycles and communities in upstate New York are likely to be worse off economically in the long run if we allow shale gas development. The oil and gas industry is a highly capital intensive industry, meaning that vastly more money is spent on equipment than on training and employing workers who typically follow the rigs from state to state. Thus, encouraging oil and gas development is not an effective strategy for creating jobs in New York. With the industry curtailing production at the same time that energy users are being encouraged to convert to natural gas, and if our shale gas is sold in the global market, supply will be reduced at the same time that demand increases. Under those circumstances, the domestic price of natural gas is unlikely to remain low in the long run. The only parties likely to benefit in the long run from shale gas development in the Marcellus Shale are the gas companies and a very few lucky and large landowners, while serious long-term costs will be borne by the public and local communities. Before making any decisions regarding shale gas drilling in New York, we must insist on comprehensive, unbiased, peer-reviewed assessments of economic impacts for the state and our communities, both short-term and long-term, 
I, I urge our leaders to do what is right for the people of New York. Thank you again. Elizabeth, why don't you go and then we'll take questions for the, the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Avella and colleagues uh, for inviting me here today. My name is Elizabeth Radow. I'm a lifelong New Yorker, a lawyer, and a mom. Uh, I practice real estate, construction, finance, risk management. Uh, my article on homeowners and gas drilling leases, boon or bust, which was in the New York State Bar Journal magazine, shined a light on the impacts of the gas drilling on the secondary mortgage market. I chair the Committee on Energy, Agriculture, and Environment, which is for formerly known as the Hydraulic Fracturing Committee for the League of Women Voters of New York State. My friend and colleague, Marianne Sullivan from the League of Women Voters, will be speaking today on behalf of the League. So it's my published research on the impacts of gas drilling and risk allocation that bring me here today. I speak on my own behalf and on behalf of homeowners impacted by fracking who have read my work and contacted me. These people tell me that they were glad when New York entered the discussion on fracking because New Yorkers are leaders, not followers. They asked me to ask Governor Cuomo if New York will preserve our water so we can be the go-to state when their water is consumed for fracking. Almost one year ago, Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee flooded New York's southern tier in regions Governor Cuomo recently targeted for possible hydraulic fracturing. With scores of homes destroyed and soon to be written off the tax rolls, impacted towns understandably need revenue. Others today, Jeanette and Chip, uh, have and will speak about the economics of gas revenue. I will focus on the expense side challenges, which I urge elected officials from all senators to town supervisors and planning boards supporting gas drilling to address and resolve before any permits are issued. According to gas industry public disclosure documents, the drilling and hydraulic fracturing life cycle involves inherently risky activity. Fracking uses hazardous substances. It can cause property damage, pollution, injury, and death. Homeowners with standard gas leases could be responsible for damage and loss resulting from gas industry operations, even though they don't control the workers or the quality of their work. Property owners forced by existing statute, compulsory integration, which Chip spoke about, uh, to accept drilling under their property are also not adequately protected. According to its own disclosure documents, the industry is not fully insured for its drilling operations, including general liability, pollution, and control of well coverage. According to a 2010 Range Resources report, substantial increases in premiums exist in regions affected by hurricanes and tropical storms. Insurers have also imposed revised limits affecting how much they will pay on actual storm claims. Last week, Nationwide Insurance, America's largest homeowner's insurance carrier, reported that the company would not bind risks presented by hydraulic fracturing, and any policies currently written with this exposure would be non-renewed. Nationwide said risks involved in fracking operations are too great to ignore and apply to all policies of commercial contractors and landowners who lease property to gas companies. Well, it comes as no surprise that homeowners insurance doesn't cover heavy industrial activity on residential property. But what does this policy clarification mean? Well, first, in cases where the industry does not have enough insurance to cover a loss, it will have to pay out of its own pocket. For homeowners, the clarification may be problematic. Here's why. If other homeowners insurance underwriters adopt Nationwide's policy not to renew homeowners insurance on properties with drilling and fracking, then southern tier families with drilling operations can find themselves with homes they can't insure, can't mortgage, and can't sell. The tax base will likely suffer as well. In 1978, torrential rains triggered the slow leaching of 20,000 tons of life-altering toxic chemicals buried in corroded drums at Love Canal, transforming this Niagara, New York region into what was characterized as the worst ecological disaster of its kind. It resulted in cancer, record numbers of miscarriages, and deformed newborns. Hundreds of families were evacuated, leaving a ghost town behind. The chemicals which caused cancer, birth defects, and threatened lives of people living near Love Canal are also used in hydraulic fracturing. 
New York has an estimated 75,000 abandoned, deteriorating oil and gas wells and deteriorating water wells also, which can act as pathways for contamination. Many have not been located, as we heard before, adding to the risk of uncontained toxic flowback and produced water surfacing in unintended ways in future drilling and fracking operations. Well blowouts from abandoned wells have been identified by gas industry underwriters as an underinsured, difficult to control, growing hazard associated with hydraulic fracturing. With the realities of climate change, heavy rainstorms are likely to revisit southern tier communities. The known impacts from Love Canal can guide New York's actions away from reasonably predictable outcomes involving fracking. As mentioned, gas drilling risks are not fully insured by the industry. DEC can hold the industry responsible for full costs associated with his actions as a condition to the issuance of any drilling permit or do nothing, which will in effect leave property owners and potentially all taxpayers vulnerable to foot the bill. In June, out of concern that the state might proceed to issue drilling permits without a safety net, I developed and sent to DEC and the state's Department of Financial Services a plan to manage drilling risks. I am submitting a copy of my risk management plan with today's testimony and am available to answer follow-up questions you might have. Serious environmental and health impacts happen in the presence of drilling and fracking operations. The industry's public disclosure documents say so. So what stops the industry and the rest of us from consistently speaking these truths? One road to common ground would be to stop framing the decision to drill in terms of safety. Inherently risky activity, by definition, isn't safe. Benzene can cause cancer, toluene can cause birth defects, silica sand can cause respiratory distress, even death. Enforced regulations with teeth might reduce the numbers, but won't alter these immutable truths or these immutable facts. In time, cement casings will crack, toxic water and air will migrate, health impacts will result, property values will suffer, and the tax base may too. Where does that leave us? Well, either New York can drill and place an unknown number of people in their property in harm's way, or we can lead the nation by pushing the pause button until the technology evolves to a point where all parties can agree on how to proceed. What's really at stake at this moment are a finite number of gas leases whose terms are about to expire, although political realities may prove otherwise. New York State stands at a crossroads. Governor Cuomo, please, let's make history and not repeat it. Thank you. I have one question, then uh, Senator Kruger has a question, and Senator Montgomery. Um, now that Nationwide has come out with this statement, I guess, last week, will other insurance companies, in your opinion, sort of follow suit? I think we're going to have to wait and see. Um, in my review of the report so far, uh, the comments have been, well, what's the big deal? Homeowners insurance never covers these risks. And I think that they're missing the nuance here. Um, this is potentially, whether or not we drill in New York State, in my opinion, a very, very serious problem, and so much so that I've been in touch with the FHFA now for almost a year when I first identified that this was going to be a problem. We've got a $6.7 trillion secondary mortgage market. It is not possible to have a mortgage without homeowner's insurance. It's possible to sign a gas lease and not tell the, to, you know, your lender, and if everything goes okay, they'll never know about it. But mortgage, you know, insurance rather, is renewed every year. And if your insurance isn't renewed, your lender will find out about it. Um, so it's my belief that yes, they will, because they're gonna wake up now. Nationwide's a big company, and what they're saying is, as, as I understand it, and I think this is going to be played out over time, we're not gonna cancel your policy, but if the drilling activity begins, on a property with a gas lease. Maybe you can even sign a gas lease, and if we do nothing, we'll leave you alone. But if the drilling begins, we will not renew your policy. So now you're going to have to go to somebody else. In my risk management plan, one of the line items that I've, uh, I've included is the obligation on the part of the industry to fund homeowners insurance. Now, whether or not that's doable, I don't know. But I'm considering 
these as construction sites, if you will, because they are. They're much more hazardous, but why don't we think about them that way? Everyone in the spacing unit should be named as an additional named insured on a policy for general liability and whatever, and the pollution and whatever else might happen, so that they don't have to go after the companies and sue them, but they should be protected as would anybody who's having construction on their property. And we'll see where that goes. Senator Kruger. Thank you. And, and, uh, Tony asked one of the first questions I was going to ask. I want to thank both of you for testifying. I've, I've worked with you both and heard, read your materials and heard you testify. Um, but Elizabeth, because of the new realizations of insurance or lack thereof, just to double check, even if your neighbors get a well and drill because of the state law where that means things can happen to you, that can also be a basis for um, an insurance company to say, no, we know it's not your property, but it's still not something we're going to insure. Is that correct? Oh, this, I, well, this is not in the statement. Again, this was a very succinct statement. As I understand it, this was something that was on a, you know, this was leaked to the press. Frankly, it's very important that it was because we need to get out ahead of this. As I said, we're, we're drilling in states all over the country. And there was somebody in Pennsylvania recently who applied for a mortgage. He does not have a gas lease, and he was denied the mortgage because there's drilling going on within a short distance of his home. We hear these hearings, we hear these stories all the time. There's this w w wonderful woman, Jamie Fredericks, in Ohio, who had compressor activity on the other side of her property. This lovely woman became very ill. She's um, had surgery, and she consumed the water that nearly killed her. Um, and her home's value has nearly plummeted. It, it, insurance companies are not in the business of giving out money if they don't need to. And so I think that once they start to understand the risks involved and parse them out, I think we're going to see the people, whether or not they have gas leases, whether or not they're forced in, if they live in proximity, we're going to have to watch this unfold and figure out, is this a runaway train? I don't have a grasp on it. I'm trying to stay ahead of it. But I think that we really do need to look at the ripple effects, because I think they could be significant. Because New York State doesn't even keep a master list of where the contracts um, have been let for allowing um, the leases, if I'm an insurance company and I want to establish this policy, how do I know where all these leases and potential drilling is going to take place? Well, this is actually one of the things that we I put in comments. We, we would like to see all of the leases recorded. And I think in many cases, the memoranda of leases are recorded. Uh, it's in the best interest of the industry to put the world on notice. But I think they don't want to put the world on notice of all of the terms of those leases, necessarily. Um, I, I would like to see a registry that has not only the leases, but the mortgages. And this is something that I've actually proposed to FHFA and I'd like to be working on. I think we need to be thinking about this again. Whether or not we do this in New York, I want to make a point. Many people sitting in this room have our retirement funds invested into the secondary mortgage market. So whether or not we drill in New York, we care that the secondary mortgage market thrives. And we have to make certain that these homes on which we're drilling do not have the property value compromised, because that will compromise the value of our retirement investment. And may I ask another mm -hmm. question? Thank you. And Jeanette, so you, you know, you've worked on the economics of all this. And I don't know whether you were here earlier when um, I asked the question about if all of this is just a land flipping Ponzi scheme story, what is what are the economics of that for New York? Is that like a win-win somehow, bizarrely, that everybody got to sell their land for more money than they thought it was worth, and thank goodness nobody's ever going to drill anyway? Well, remember, most of the most of these are leases we're talking about, and flipping leases is what we're talking about, and um, so no, a lot of people didn't really sell their land for a lot of profit. Um, and uh, that, that I've heard that as well, like a land grab. That's what it was with Chesapeake Energy, for example. And um, I really recommend the work of Deborah Rogers. I think Chip mentioned that name. Um, she's done a lot of work on explaining this very, very clearly. But that's um, nobody benefits. And as I've always said, in the long run, the only parties that are going to benefit are the gas companies and a few lucky and large landowners. Um, 
could I add one thing here? I left out of my testimony, but I think it's important given some of the talk I heard uh, Chip mentioned a, uh, you know, the lack of a severance tax, and that's really important because no money was going to go to New York State unless we have a severance tax or something like it. Um, and I know that the supporters of gas drilling are often touting the ad valorem tax as a great tax revenue for the communities. Um, there are a lot of uncertainties associated with the ad valorem tax. And um, one of one of the problem, one of the big problems with them is the way it's done is uh, it's not collected until several years into the production. Um, so a lot of these these are small communities we're talking about in upstate New York, and they don't have a lot of excess cash to cover the very, very significant costs that they will incur in the beginning of production. Um, even before production starts, they'll have a lot of costs. So I don't know where they're going to get that cash from an ad valorem tax. The way it's calculated is problematic, and we can go into details at another time. But another important thing to remember is that it is based on production, and that production is self-reported by the gas companies. Um, something has to be done about that because they have to; those, those numbers have to be checked. And when I looked at numbers from um, the Division of Mineral Resources regarding tax revenue from um, gas wells in the past, in 2009, the numbers indicate that um, that they received about $600 per per well in 2009. That won't be nearly enough to cover the types of costs we're talking about here. Thanks. Yeah, I wanted to respond with respect to um, the leases in this, the, la the land grab. The industry wants to hold on to these leases because they have made, they have borrowed money and the leases are the collateral for the loan, okay? And these loans go on for a long time. Uh, the lease terms are maybe five years and that's why they're using these so-called force majeure provisions to keep the leases alive. Now, on the one hand, it may be good for the homeowner never to have the drilling because the property won't be contaminated, but the difficulty there or the challenge for a homeowner is if they have a gas lease and they go to a bank to get uh, a loan, the, the bank is going to know that there's a gas lease there and they're going to see that as a potential problem and may not, it's, a, it's an encumbrance on a property. And they may say, you know what, my loan goes for 30 years you know, 90% of all loans are sold into the secondary mortgage market. Your setbacks aren't so great, but let's put setbacks aside. We're not going to give you the loan. The, the risk is too, too great. So it's not really a win-win for, for people who have signed g gas leases. Uh, whether or not they made enough money up front, you know, maybe some of them, they'll never be drilling activity, and frankly, that would probably be the best thing that could happen to them, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Senator Montgomery? Yeah, I think my question has been answered. It sounds to me uh, like um, if you are a property owner and because the regulations in our state for setbacks or the distance between the uh, property, your property and a well uh, are so weak um, that um, my neighbor could have a lease. I don't choose to be involved, but because of the proximity of the well to my property, um, I also may not be able to um, have insurance uh, on my well, property or to be able to get a mortgage. Well, the, the, there's a lot of focus on the distance between the residence and the vertical well, but one of the things we should keep in mind, and again, I've spoken to the FHFA about this, is that there's also horizontal activity going on, and this is a multi-step process. There are compressor stations, there's heavy industrial activity going on, there's waste retention going on. If we just look at the distance between the well bore, the vertical well bore and the house, conceivably, you could put waste disposal in between that distance and not be violating a setback. That doesn't make sense, obviously. Um, it's my belief that people who are underwriting the loans don't understand the multi step process involved, why would they? So we really do have to have an education campaign for people who are, insure, who are underwriting both loans and mortgages. And a specific answer to your question, yes, people living next door who haven't signed leases may also be, you know, denied. And I think we're going to have to look at that. I think this story will unfold. So entire communities could be impacted even though half or more of the people don't want to be involved. Again, this man uh, applied for a mortgage and he was denied even though he didn't have a gas lease. Refinancing in Pennsylvania. Sure. Um, do you have 
will you leave with us copies of your testimony? Yes, I've given it to Rebecca, sure. Proposals that you, you yes. have. And I'd be happy at any time, um, you've got my contact information, I'd be happy to speak to you. I live in uh, Westchester County, I'd be happy to come into the city and sit down with you anytime. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Wait, wait, one last question, and I guess this is uh, for Jeanette. You know, one of the things that drives me crazy uh, from when I hear the supporters of hydrofracking, they keep throwing out this number of 70,000 jobs were created in Pennsylvania, um, which we don't believe is true, totally manufactured number. But can you comment on that? Where did this 70,000 number ever come from? Um, I've heard various numbers. The 70,000, um, if I'm correct, came from one of the multiple studies that were funded by the gas industry. Um, they use uh, typically, uh, uh, I think this one came from a study that used something called input-output analysis. And um, there are a number of technical reasons why input-output analysis is not accurate as a predicting tool um, in this particular application. Um, I could go through a lot of details, and I have in my writing. But um, uh, first of all, they don't. In, they don't. It doesn't reflect declines in other industries that I talked about. It doesn't reflect the fact that what input-output analysis always assumes is that um, um, every every individual has the same spending patterns, and this is certainly not true in the gas industry, where we have transient workers coming in and spending most of their income in their home states like Texas and Oklahoma where their families are. Um, these models are all assuming that all of these people are, are, are residents here and are spending all their money here in New York, and that's just not true. And there are a number of more technical reasons why it's not uh, an appropriate um, technique. However, in one of the um, studies, I think I had seen also, I think they at one study had shown something like 90,000 uh, jobs. Um, but in that same year that 90,000 were supposed to be created, I believe, as I recall, when I looked at the actual data from the Department of Labor, there were actually only, um, there were far fewer than that total jobs created in the entire state of Pennsylvania, and half of those were in um, education and health, and, and the other half were in leisure and hospitality. So it wasn't even as though um, their numbers don't match up. With, uh, we know that those numbers don't even match up with the 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 unbiased publicly available data and I've seen that time and time again. What words in your mouth would you say that those figures are greatly exaggerated? Greatly exaggerated, okay. yes. Good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to pronounce some of the next names, and I apologize if I pronounce it wrong. Larissa Dierstra, did I pronounce it right? Um, Sandra Steingraber and Elaine Hill. Great to have all those materials you emailed us. We'll have somebody pick that up from you. You don't have to. <laughs> I think there's an order. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Senator Avella, for the invitation to speak. My name is Larissa. Move the microphone closer, and you're going to have to speak a little louder. <clears throat> My name is Larissa Durska, and I'm a board certified pediatrician currently working on public health advocacy. And my written testimony provides a timeline with supporting documentation of uh, from the time that we became aware of health impacts and doctors became involved and the requests we've made to various agencies in New York State and the responses. This is just a summary. In October of 2008, West Gillingham first called attention to health impacts in gas development that I was aware of. And he actually asked, asked for a health impact assessment. And other than concerned citizens like Wes, there were no independent health experts and medical doctors involved in the scoping of the SGIS. I first looked at the document, the SGIS, 
um, in 2009, so this was a year after um, the scoping part, and locating any health information was nearly impossible as there was no chapter on human health. So I picked out areas that I was concerned about and that specifically were, um, and which were glaringly omitted, and as a pediatrician I was looking for children's health. And um, what also caught my attention, because we live, I knew that we lived in overlying the Marcellus Shale and in Sullivan County over high radon counts, and so I was concerned about the radon at that point. It just looked like, a co some, like it was related. So we were pleased when the Environmental Protection Agency announced the hydrofracking study. Uh, because that was the first that any agency had addressed health impacts regarding water specifically. When a bill was presented in the New York State Legislature for a moratorium pending the EPA study, the American Academy of Pediatrics of New York State became the first medical organization to advocate on this issue. As you know, the bill passed both houses in the fall of 2010, but Governor Patterson vetoed it, instead issuing Executive Order 41. The resolution concluded with the recognition that the regulatory conditions be protective of public health and the environment. So we were encouraged by the governor's reference to public health protections, although we had no idea what the comments were, uh, that comments were never submitted on the SGIS publicly, uh, and they still haven't been from the first draft of the SGIS. So we don't know who commented, who said what, and we also um, don't know how those uh, were integrated uh, into the SGIS. So we didn't know what those protections would be, but at least the public health issue was mentioned. Because nothing seemed to be coming out from um, the Department of Health, there was very little uh, contact with the Department of Health. Uh, we didn't know whether the DEC was integrating any of the health uh, impacts that we were becoming aware of. In February of 2011, a group of concerned doctors, uh, which included actually thousands of doctors, American Academy of Pediatrics as a group signed on, and they represent 6,000 pediatricians sent a letter to Dr. Nirav Shah, who is the New York State Commissioner of Health, to inform him of the potential health impacts and to request that the Department of Health become a co-lead agency on the ESGIS. Additionally, the signatories asked that the ESGIS be withdrawn and the process begun again with the inclusion of a health impact assessment. So we started asking at that point for a health impact assessment uh, as a group of physicians. And we also asked for a meeting with Dr. Shah. Dr. Howard Freed, then director of Department of Health Center for Environmental Health and is no longer there, replied on April 12th, assuring us that the Department of Health has been involved with the DEC in the ESGIS process, but that DOH will not be a co-lead agency on the document. And they cited some legal reasons, which I believe are arguable. In addition, the letter stated that the Department of Health was assisting Department of Environmental Conservation in the revisions to the draft and urged that we comment on the new draft when it comes out. So that was the response to our all, all of the points that we had made, all of our observations, all of the education that we were trying to um, relay to um, Dr. Shah. And this wasn't even coming from Dr. Shah. It was from the Center for Environmental Health. Um, and in view of the thorough review, this is continuing what the letter said, and in view of the thorough review of potential health impacts that's being conducted as part of the ESGIS process, they did not believe that another methodology, such as health impact assessment, would provide significant additional information. But we were offered a meeting at the Center for Environmental Health. So a few months later, uh, after the letter was sent, uh, on June 3rd of 2011, Dr. Ron Bishop and I met with Mr. Robert Chinnery, Dr. Freed, Dr. Storm, and Dr. Salame Alfi, in addition to presentations that both Dr. Uh, Bishop and I made. Um, Dr. Bishop was talking a lot about the um, uh, abandoned well problem, and uh, I was talking about toxic chemicals. Um, but toward the end of the meeting, I asked about the possibility, again, I asked, of including a health impact assessment, and the reply by Mr. Chinnery was that health impacts had been addressed, and I asked if I could see that in the SGIS, and Mr. Chinnery said that it will be available for public comment soon. There would be no preview. Toward the end of September, a revised SGIS was released by the DEC, 
So we had had no preview, no indication whether any of our comments would be incorporated in the revised draft as guys, and they were not. There were still significant gaps, most glaringly on health impacts. The broad determinants of human health were not addressed, nor were community impacts, which are increasingly being recognized as a major problem wherever gas development is occurring. Children will, were still not mentioned once in the document, nor were any vulnerable populations. Social and environmental justice issues, issues received no attention. Worker safety with regard to radioactivity and silica sand exposure, as well as transportation safety issues. And we know that there are major problems, uh, death rates, um, uh, fatality rates, uh, seven times those of the national average uh, in the United States. And this is reported by the C CDC and NIOSH that these issues really should receive some attention. Um, so besides that, health infrastructure would need to be addressed. These costs that communities were going to have to be, uh, are going to be facing upfront costs, um, and also social issues such as uh, increased drug use and sexually transmitted diseases, all of that needs to be prepared for. Also, since 2009, there have been several peer-reviewed papers published on health and climate change impacts by recognized doctors and scientists such as Witter, Colburn, Haworth, Ingrafia, Santoro, Law, Finkel, Goldstein, Bamberger, Oswald, and others. And none of this literature was included in the SG, uh, revised draft as guys, nor was there any provision made for emerging research to be included in the future. Public health, independent scientists, and medical professionals continue to be disregarded. In July of 2011, Commissioner Martens appointed a hydrofracking advisory panel. Again, no scientists or health professionals were included on this advisory panel. Yet, representatives of uh, leased landholders and um, uh, elected officials and, uh, in, and industry all were represented. Because the DEC seemed to be ignoring the science, a letter was sent to Governor Cuomo on October 5th of 2011 from health professionals requesting that he order a health impact assessment. There was no reply from his office. Further, going, going the next step, as the budget was being drafted in March of 2012, several medical organizations called for the inclusion of a health impact assessment, and that included the American Academy of Pediatrics of New York State, the Medical Society of the State of New York, New York State Nurses Association, the University of Rochester Medical Center, the New York State Academy of Family Physicians and Healthy Schools Network. It was not included. And neither has the governor issued an executive order directing that an HIA be done. Medical doctors and independent scientists are overwhelmingly in support of allowing science to direct the path that gas development will take in New York State. But first, the scientific literature must be embraced and doctors and scientists invited to the table. It's been clear that the administration of New York State has been given ample opportunity to study the science that has been handed to them time and time again, as well as to understand processes intended to be protective of human health, such as the health impact assessment. But instead of accepting the science and the recommendations of thousands of New York doctors and scientists and openly and transparently conducting discourse with them, they have chosen to collaborate with industry and to shut the door to science. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Senator Avella and distinguished members of the Senate. Thank you for inviting me to speak. My name is Sandra Steingraber. I'm a PhD biologist. I did my doctoral training at the University of Michigan. I currently serve as the distinguished scholar in residence within the Department of Environmental Studies at Ithaca College. And for the last 20 years, I have been working in the field of environmental health. And in that capacity, I've had the honor of serving on a number of public health advisories. Um, I've included some of those in my written comments to you. Uh, I've worked on both the state and federal uh, level. Uh, perhaps the report I'm most proud of uh, preparing was being a lead editor uh, of the University of California report called Identifying Gaps in Breast Cancer Research. And uh, by the way, the state of California um, funds breast cancer research through its cigarette tax uh, money. Um, and so this document was um, 
showed how how best how we could get the best bang for our buck in terms of research dollars spent on breast cancer, how many women's lives could be saved. Um, and I spent uh, two or three years on that report, and when it came out, it was uh, 510 pages. And I thought that was pretty monumental until I read the revised draft supplemental environmental impact statement for hydraulic fracking, uh, the S guys, which is three times as long and weighs 15 pounds. I wish I could say that the S guys is three times as thorough. It is not. Uh, the scientific review upon which the decision to permit or prohibit hydrofracking in our state is to rest on arbitrary data, uh, which dresses up assertions as fact with no supporting empirical evidence. By contrast, my planning document that I worked with, uh, with the state of California, everything in the uh, bibliography was peer-reviewed science, and uh, the report itself went out for peer review before uh, it was accepted by the state. Uh, Instead, uh, the SGEIS makes no attempt to evaluate the effects of shale gas extraction on public health or even to quantify the medical cost. Instead, it simply denies that the health impacts exist at all. And to put a finer point on this, if you go to the bibliography in the SGEIS um, on this section that's headed potential environmental, p potential health effects of fracking, the first entry in that bibliography uh, is a document by the American Petroleum Association. So last month, uh, the Gannett journalist John Campbell reported that the, uh, the state's county health departments had, last January, expressed grave concerns about the omission of health in a pair of reports to the state's 18-member uh, fracking advisory panel. However, right before the panelists could see the report or meet with its authors, the panel itself was placed on hiatus. And when I read about the disappearance of this set of uh, public health documents, I actually felt better because it helped explain a pattern of refusal by both the Department of Environmental Conservation and the governor's office to acknowledge similar communiques submitted by New York's doctors and scientists, including some of the ones that I've prepared and certainly, as you've heard, Dr. Driska as well. Now, I brought with me some of the statements that I've uh, worked on, which I can submit to you. The first two are a pair of letters that I wrote to DEC Commissioner Joe Joseph Martens shortly after he and I were both keynote speakers at an EPA conference on environmental health. And in these letters I detailed new research findings on fracking related air pollutants and associated risks for heart disease. I received no response. The third is a letter from October 11th signed by many hundreds of health professionals and scientists. It asked the DEC for a comprehensive health assessment. We received no reply. The fourth, from December of 2011, is a fully referenced review that speaks directly to the cancer risks posed by drilling and fracking operations. It's signed by dozens of cancer advocacy organizations representing more than 100,000 New York cancer survivors and their physicians. No reply from the DEC. By contrast, the gas industry's uh, concerns and queries over the same time period were met by much more than stone walls by the DEC. So now we know, thanks to the Environmental Working Group, that, uh, that it's the industry representatives enjoyed throughout the period of the S. Geis's creation and revisions, lively email exchanges, phone conversations, face-to-face -face meetings, and at the very least, sneak peeks at the manuscript in progress. So the paper that is supposed to provide our governor the science that he needs to make a crucial decision was crafted with the guidance of the gas industry, not the New York State scientists or doctors. So little wonder that this draft document bears little resemblance to an impartial, comprehensive scientific review. It do, this document looks nothing like this, the science reviews that I've prepared. No wonder that after four years of study, we cannot answer fundamental questions like, will fracking in New York kill more people than it employs? Will, who will be harmed by fracking? And how much will these injuries cost? And for that analysis, I'm pleased that my testimony today is going to be followed by that of Elaine Hill, who has new groundbreaking research to share from Pennsylvania on the natural, uh, uh, impacts of natural gas extraction on the health of, of newborn babies. And I want to take this chance before you hear her testimony to commend Ms. Hill for her courage in coming forward and sharing her data. She's doing so today because I asked her to. And I would like to say that she's a doctoral student with her whole career in front of her. She has no protection of tenure. She's bringing forth now the first population-based observational data for harm to human beings uh, near, who live near drilling and fracking operations. And those human beings are, are newborn babies. So is this, review, is this uh, data peer reviewed? No, it's part of her dissertation. Should it be peer reviewed before we bring it to light? Well, of course. 
except that we're in a situation here where it seems like the emotions, namely the heedless, self-interested frenzy of a gas rush type emotions, are moving this so fast that the science can't get done to really inform whether we should move forward or not. So either we don't include any peer-reviewed data in the decision, in which case we need to go through the yes guys and strip out all the industry data, um, or we wait until the science gets done and is peer-reviewed, in which case we don't move forward until Ms. Hill and other scientists get their data into the uh, peer-reviewed medical literature. We have a chance to uh, take a look at it, and, and then we make a decision. But both of those things can't be true. So I trust. Uh, I, I would like to commend her courage. I think the courage she's showing today in coming forward and speaking truth to power should be matched by other acts of courage uh, in members of our own state government. And I certainly trust that her words today will be met by more than silence. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Avella and distinguished members of the Senate wherever they went. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. I am going to be addressing the infant health impacts of unconventional natural gas development, including what has been termed fracking, which is what I'll call it throughout my, my testimony, in light of recent cutting edge results that have emerged from my PhD research. My name is Elaine Hill, and I am a PhD student in the Dyson School of Applied Economics and Management at Cornell University. While my areas of expertise include health economics and econometrics more broadly, my dissertation research investigates specifically the infant health impacts of unconventional natural gas development in the states of Pennsylvania, Colorado, and Texas. Today, I will share with you results from the first working paper to come out of this effort, which focuses on the applicable case of Marshall shale drilling in Pennsylvania. While not yet submitted for publication, this work has benefited from the reviews of several experts in the field and was presented at the Population Association of America meetings in May. The complete draft under the working title of Unconventional Natural Gas Development and Infant Health Evidence from Pennsylvania was included with my written testimony. Drilling in Pennsylvania began in 2006 and by the end of 2010 there were over 4,000 wells. With this expansion, it is becoming increasingly common for fracking to take place in close proximity to where people live, work, and play. Serious environmental and health concerns have emerged regarding fracking, which outweigh the benefits of the which may outweigh the benefits of the technique. There have been no robust observational studies that can be used concretely to inform policy to date. My research attempts to fill this gap. There is a strong rationale for focusing on infant health impacts. Building evidence indicates that poor health at birth is indicative of long-lasting negative health outcomes over the life course, poor educational attainment and employment status, mental illness, and even intergenerational transmission of poor birth outcomes to the next generation. In the interest of time, I will not discuss my research methods in great detail. However, I'm happy to answer any questions about them. Preliminary results suggest that proximity to wells have both statistically and economically significant effects on infant health. A mother's exposure to fracking before birth increases the overall prevalence of low birth weight by 25%, increases overall prevalence of small for gestational age by 17%, and reduces average five minute APGAR scores. Low birth weight is of primary concern for not only healthcare practitioners, but society at large, and hence policymakers. It is associated with a host of adverse outcomes and often means lifelong disability. Small for gestational age and low APGAR scores are correlated with the likelihood to require uh, respiratory res support, longer hospital stays, neonatal intensive care, and infant mortality. According to current estimates, a single low birth weight infant costs society on average $51,000 during the first year of life. This is likely a severe underestimate, as it does not include parental lost earnings or additional educational, health, and social support over their lifetime. Using this as a lower bound, however, my estimates in Pennsylvania suggest that the cost of all infants exposed before birth to fracking would be $2.2 million. If all permits issued as of 2010 by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection were actually drilled, the cost would be closer to $20 million at this time. And I don't include 2011, so stay tuned. Uh, while not, in, not comprehensive, um, oh, excuse me, 
These estimates not only identify a large societal cost that is not currently included in the cost-benefit analysis of fracking, but raise questions about what longer-term exposures will mean for families. The regulation suggested it is safe for people to live 300 feet from gas drilling, while my research suggests that it is not safe up to a distance of at least three miles for families with pregnant women. This indicates in the very least that policymakers need to reevaluate regulations regarding allowable proximity of gas drilling to residences, schools, and hospitals. While not comprehensive, this study shows that under the current regulatory framework, fracking does involve risks to human life, and further research into these health impacts is clearly warranted. Before allowing the practice of fracking to take place in New York, policymakers should consider the need for a comprehensive and rigorous health study that examines a multitude of factors and especially longer term impacts. They should also carefully consider the regulatory framework that would most effectively mitigate the inherent risks. I would like to close by speaking for a moment as a citizen rather than a researcher. I was born in Rochester, New York and have lived in New York most of my life. I am engaged to be married and hope to start a family very soon. I began this research because as a researcher I identified this gap in our knowledge. But as a New York State resident, I hope to put myself at ease regarding the concerns around fracking in upstate New York. My findings, however, indicate that this practice may be harmful, in particular to me and other women starting families. I, un I fully understand the economic potential for this technology and its importance for the state, but hope for the sake of my generation and our future children that New York will do its part to ensure our health and safety by refraining from allowing fracking to begin until the questions raised by the research presented today are answered. Thank you for your time. Your testimony, Senator Kruger has a question, then I have one question. Uh, one, thank you for your testimony. So, Dr. Dykstra, we have worked together before, um, and I just want to get everybody's name right, Dr. Steingraper and almost Dr. Hill. <laughs> just for the record, it is so crucial that you come out and you testify, so thank you for taking the risk, because I do understand that from the academic perspective. The concept for me, and I've and I've been working and read Larissa's materials that she's been forwarding on behalf of the medical community now for several years. The concept that the state of New York wouldn't factor in as critical to any decision making we make about hydrofracking in the state. The fact that we lose the documents, we don't quite get from point A to point B, we ignore that Department of Health is supposed to do some kind of research and then it hasn't been asked of them. We have findings from healthcare professionals and researchers. I mean, you people are not chopped liver, you're the real thing. Okay, you're scientists and you keep coming forward and saying there are real health concerns here, they have to be factored in, um, that frankly I'm appalled that the state of New York isn't listening to you. So I want to thank you very much for coming and being persistent and continuing to send your materials and hopefully the public and the press are listening because, you know, we can imagine what the movie afterwards will look like about when the bad things happened in New York, but who wants to live through that, right? So thank you for testifying, and I apologize. I have a conference call. I have to go run and get on right now, but thank you again. Thank you, Tony. You know, I also, uh, you know, some of the, your comments about sending letters to the governor and DEC and not getting answered, it's similar to, some of the testimony that we heard earlier. I, I have to say, it's to me, as a person who um, answers every single letter that I get as an elected official, to have the governor of the state of New York and the agency that's supposed to be responsible, whether it's Department of Health or DEC, not respond to scientists or even average day citizens, I mean, it's just an absolute disgrace. The one thing I wanted to ask, and whomever wants to respond to this, you can, the Senate Democratic Conference has been totally in support of having a health assessment and also a seismic assessment done before hydrofracking is allowed. We um, have tried to get an answer out of DEC and health and the governor's office. And the only response we get is, well, we can't study the health until we actually have hydrofracking. You know, now, I'd like you just to answer that response because I think that's absolutely ridiculous. 
but I'm not the expert. You're the experts. You're the scientists. You're the doctors. Right. Um, and we've we've uh, educated through our letters uh, all the departments in, and the governor's office. Hopefully, hopefully they've read the letters, but we have described the process of health impact assessment. And it's intended to be done before a particular land use decision is implemented. It is supposed to inform the decision makers of the risks uh, so that there could be a decision made whether or not you should go forward with it if it's too risky. If its risks are tolerable, what are the recommendations for mitigations? Or, you know, you can just, it can be decided or recommended that n no mitigations are necessary. But you need to do this beforehand. It involves many different public health tools, which is why it's, a, it's possible to do this before it, the process, uh, before uh, the land use decision is, is implemented. Uh, because it includes surveys from other areas, opinions from experts from other areas, there could be a risk assessment done, which uh, is possible in, uh, for a particular chemical, but that's not the main part of a health impact assessment. So it involves many processes, and then all of that information is brought together and presented to the, um, to the decision makers. And many stakeholders are involved. That's the other really um, uh, interesting and, and uh, useful part of this is many stakeholders, any stakeholder who wants to have their uh, opinion heard or has something to add is invited to the table. And it's transparent. So in, in many ways, it's very similar to environmental impact statement, but in many ways, it's very different in the way we would have envisioned it. Um, yeah, I would also like to add, in addition, that the, the health impact assessment is a tool specifically designed to understand what the health impacts will be before we carry something out. In addition, um, because New York stands at, alone as one of the few states with this moratorium that's protected us, we have are all around us unintended human experiments. So, you know, we're the control study across the border in Pennsylvania is the test case where we have inadvertently exposed people, um, uh, including pregnant women, um, to uh, air pollution, water pollution, and so forth. And so we can certainly let those data from looking at health effects across the border inform what we want to do, which is why uh, Ms. Ms. Hill's study is so crucial f for us. And uh, she can speak for her study more if she, she likes. I, what, what uh, as a scientist, and looking at her as an economy, economist, what impresses me is that she was able to find what we in the um, uh, medical field would call a natural human experiment, meaning she could go in and look at hospital records of APGAR scores and birth weights before fracking came into a community and then compare them to a after fracking came in. We don't have any studies um, other than kind of case studies uh, like that. And so the fact that she's seeing effects on babies that are greater than that of tobacco smoking. So if a mother smokes, we know it lowers, uh, the, it shrinks babies, it makes babies smaller, and it, it puts them at risk for all kinds of health effects later on down the line, which is why we engage in anti-tobacco work, especially for pregnant women. But she's seeing effects equal to or, or larger than th those effects. And so those are things that we can pay attention to here in New York and put some dollar signs on, um, as, as economists are uh, allow us to do, um, so that we can actually balance the costs, both in suffering and in real dollars, against the so-called economic uh, benefits. So I just want to say that my dissertation will encompass two other states, and so I'll be replicating this. Um, in the interest of uh, any sort of scientific study, we want to replicate it. Uh, however, in the case of Pennsylvania, it's a very short window of time, and my results are really large, actually. And I do control for mother smoking while they're pregnant. So um, these are actually birth certificate records. They're the entire universe of births in Pennsylvania, and they have detailed information about um, health at birth and also uh, condition of timing during pregnancy. So um, I control for those things. I control for mother's um, uh, education and her race and her age and um, and factors that we think would impact the health outcomes that I find of interest. Um, and I use the permits, which are handy, <laughs> to identify um, the control group. So we know locations where drill a uh, well is drilled in the future, and so I can determine, um, determine that. And the distances that I'm looking at are very small. 
So the the results that I presented today are less than is is about a 1.5 mile radius around a well, and those are the, that's the size of the impact that we're finding, um, which. Um, I'm a little concerned about because it, it, it is much larger than what you would expect for smoking in pregnancy. To get back to my original question, one word or less, one word or less, it can't be two words or less. Um, when the state says they can't do a health assessment impact study because we don't have hydrofracking yet, one, two words or less, that's all I need to know. They're wrong. Okay. Thank you. We're going to take a short break because our next uh, person is Josh Fox, who you all know, and he's going to have a four-minute clip, I think, which is a preview of his next film on hydrofracking. So he's oh, an expert. Okay, but an expert. Um, so we'll take a few-minute break, a few minutes, while he sets up. 